It is an absolute fact that bread has become one of the most talked about subjects in America today, thanks to the furor over carbohydrates. Practically everywhere you look in the world of food, low carb is in, and that's especially true in the bread business. And to get some idea of just how important this trend has become, we've come to one of the oldest family-owned bakeries in the city of New York, which is now producing a low-carb version of practically every product they make. This is the Damascus Bakery in Brooklyn, which was started back in 1930. Today, the founder's two grandsons, David and Ed Mafood, have turned this bakery into one of the most sophisticated, state-of-the-art facilities that can be found practically anywhere in the world. At first, the low-carb phenomenon hurt the bread industry. A lot of people were shying away from bread because they were told that too many carbs are going to hurt them in their quest to lose weight. I think ultimately people realize that you can't enjoy a sandwich without bread. So bakeries, responsible bakeries, said to themselves, what can we do for the person looking to reduce carbohydrate and still enjoy a sandwich? Take a company like ourselves who makes pitas, wraps, lavash wraps, panini flatbreads. These are good items for low carb crazed eaters because first of all there's not much weight to it. If you're going to reduce the carbs, you, you're going to reduce the carbs a couple of ways. You're going to do it by formulation and you're going to do it by weight. A flatbread itself is already low in weight so we already had a heads up. Secondly, unlike some other breads that are doughy and don't chew well with reduced carb formulation, a wrap was pretty much ideal. You know, you just mentioned lavash bread. I really don't know what that is. What is it? This is, um, if we go back in time, if uh, we open the Bible, you know, perhaps, and, and read what Adam and Eve used to eat, it very possibly was this bread. Um, why lavash? because it's probably the most simplest bread to make. Water, yeast, flour, a little bit of fermentation. You would traditionally bake it on a stone kind of oven, the way prehistoric people could have. And it's a Middle Eastern bread. It's a staple in the Middle East. A few years back, leave it to the American restaurant tour to say, how can we take a bread and make a wrap sandwich? They took a tortilla, perhaps first, or maybe a lavash, they rolled it up and they said, this is a neat thing. This is different from a sandwich on American bread. It's different from a sandwich on a Kaiser roll. It's different from a bagel sandwich. And so the wrap craze kind of hit America. What Lavash did is separate itself from a tortilla. It, it went to a store and said, now you can do similar to what the bagel did. You have a regular bagel, then you had a boiled bagel. Makes the same sandwich, choose completely different more crust, more breadiness, more upscale look, uh, much more appeal. And you make a low-carb version of that? This year, like, like every responsible bakery, we made a low-carb version of this. We, we introduced it in whole wheat, which we felt would be a big selling item. Um, we also took a stab at some other varieties. We did not want to position ourselves like other bakeries, which said, here is my low-carb product, take it or leave it. We didn't know what size, what varieties people would want, so we said, let's just do it all. See what bites. You might want one, the next company might make another. We introduced a variety called flax. A lot of people don't know what flax is. Those that do know that it's actually healthy for you. Know that your nutritionist probably wants you to supplement it, even if you don't have any kind of weight or health concerns came out with a red pepper and onion. Who said low carb breads can't be gourmet? Who said they can't have spice to it? Why do they just have to be plain or whole wheat? Came out with a rye. We came out with a 12 inch, came out with a 10 inch, came out with a rectangle, seven and a half by nine inch. Now is that for a wrap? Well, this is a roll up. You wouldn't wrap it and you might ask, well, why are we making a rectangle for a wrap? Well, it's not for a wrap. We felt that if you're trying to lose weight, if your concern is to reduce carbs, we've done this with formulation, but we felt that if you took a wrap, and I'm going to open up a pack and show you, if you took a wrap, 
it smells great, and you filled it, and you wrapped it up, okay, it's a great sandwich. It's only one thing. One third of your bread really s serves no function. It's excess bread. It's kind of like wrapping paper on a Christmas gift. With this size, with this rectangle, you could put as much filling on this as you could in this, but with less bread. Less bread means less carbs, and it means less cost. I know you are a food technologist, and I'm just wondering, I'm not familiar with that title, what does a food technologist do? In this company, I'm responsible for the quality assurance program. Also, I'm doing a product development. Product development? Right. In other words, you're helping develop new products right. to come on the market. Right. Explain to me exactly what role you play in this in this process of making bread. Well, customers, when you buy something, you want to have the same product every time you buy it. You want to buy with the same amount of money, you want to get the same quality. And that's basically my role. Uh, my role is to provide the highest quality of uh, product that we produce here to all of our customers. And how do you do that? How do you assure um, that? We, um, we have to give a guideline to the people what's the standards, what's our specification, the, the quality standards, and then we give them training. We do checking on the line, you know, making, making sure uh, we use the right formula, we use the right ingredients, and then we process it well, you know, it has a, a good weight, the product is thin, it's baked well, it's cooled well, and then it tastes good. Herman Dixon is one of the long-time employees here at the bakery. Herman has been here 30 years 30 now, years, right? Yeah. Have you seen a lot of changes through oh, the years? Oh, a great lot of changes. It's more modern. We have very good equipment. Before, we used to work more with hand power, our different machines. But now, a couple of years ago now, we have all these modern machines. It's a big change. It's a 100% change. The business, the different flavors of bread that we're making, the different stuff that will make it exciting. What's, what's it like to work here? Very great. I'm very happy with my job. When I, whenever I come to work, I'm very pleased because I've grown up in the bakery and I see so many changes that it makes me feel very interested that, that, that like, I'm, like I'm a part of the bakery. And what do, you, what do you do primarily? Well, really, I take care right now of the, of the rock lines. First now, we go to all these shows, Las Vegas, Chicago, well, several the shows is I go with the company and we do very well. We get a lot of new clients and everybody's pleased and I enjoy doing all of what I'm doing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that this bakery was the very first to market and produce pita bread here in the U.S. Is that right? Historically, my grandfather was the first. He was the pioneer. My grandfather uh, had a son who was going to take over part of the business. My father bought in the other half of the business. And within two, three years, my father said, this bread is too good to keep to the Middle Eastern section of Brooklyn. We need to get this throughout America. Now, some people applauded him. Some thought that my mother should call the psychiatrist. My father said, give me three years and let me show you, and he did. What other major products do you produce today? Our newest product is called the Panini Flatbread. We, we've seen where paninis are becoming a big item, or they are already a big sandwich item in America. It's come from Italy, it, it sounds different. Americans are always looking for the next new sandwich. And so we went to a lot of places and talked about their panini sandwich and we asked what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. And what we found out is a lot of panini sandwiches are made on a bread called ciabatta bread. We found that the ciabatta bread, albeit a good taste in bread, didn't allow the grill to melt the cheese, warm up the meats, unless it kind of scorched the bread. What these stores are looking for is something that is flatter so that you can layer it with cheese, meats, cheese again, fold it over, grill it, create a nice crust, but yet conduct enough heat to melt the center cheese and warm up the meats. So we created a square because it made a lot more sense than some of the other shapes, and we formulated it so that it has a doughy inside, but yet a crust that when grilled will really crisp up and give you that nice bite that you want when you eat a panini sandwich and we've had good response you know when you come right down to it just how sophisticated is this bakery 
What you're looking at here is state of the art in the baking industry. You're not going to see anything like this in, in all of the world. We, it puts us right on the cutting edge of producing the types of products that we produce. How many employees do you have now? Today we're operating with approximately 90 employees. You know, it's really obvious you put an awful lot of effort and expense into this facility and, and, and the making of this product. In the last several years, we spent a lot of time and energy and money to investigate modern technology to take a old world product and to bring it to modern time. We knew that we could not maintain uh, capacity given the old production line. So uh, approximately three and a half years ago, I started traveling to various uh, points throughout the world. I went to Europe, down to South America, and to various points throughout the United States investigating technology to create a system such as what we have here to produce high quantity products with the highest possible quality in mind. In fact, given this technology that we have here, we've actually exceeded the old quality line. Our customers have given us a thumbs up on the products that we have been producing in the last year and a half to two years since we've, we, brought, we brought in the new technology. So I've, I've been very, very uh, d delighted and enthusiastic about uh, incorporating this new system into our facility. This is the front end of our new automated line. What's happening right now? Well, right now he's changing the formulation for this robotic mixing system. He's just entered a new formula. He's proceeding to incorporate ingredients based on this formula into our mix. Explain what you're reading on the dial. This is the current fo formulation that we're running on this system. This is our robotic system, mixing system, state of the art that we imported from Italy approximately a year and a half ago. So uh, in this particular case, we are running a potato panini formula. And what you see on the screen here are the components of that formula. From white flour to potato flour to semolina, we have water incorporated with canola oil and a uh, sugar. So these are the particular ingredients that comprise this particular formula. Once the person at this station selects this particular formula, the wheels of motion take place. This is where all the ingredients are incorporated in our robotic mixing system. From flour, water, salt, yeast, whatever the particular formulation is, all those ingredients are entered at this point. And after all the ingredients are entered into that bowl, the bowl is moved by the robot and it's moved over to one of two free spiral mixers. Now what's happening at this particular mixer, the head of the uh, mixer is lifting up. It has completed mixing a dough. We are going to take that massive dough and we are going to sheet it out into one continuous sheet of dough, progressively making it thinner and thinner. We are going from a dough that is approximately one inch in thickness, or let's say an inch and a half, and we will bring it down to something that is now a fraction of an inch. At that point, we are cutting shapes and different sizes out of that piece of dough, and that is what the final product is going to be like. Now at this point in the line, it's down to, it looks like less than a quarter of an inch thick. Now what's all that flour? Well, in order to sheet the dough, which means that the dough is being processed by the mechanical elements of the line. We need to add, add flour to it. That prevents the dough from sticking to any one component on this production line. As for this TV screen over here, this is the brain center of this production line. This controls every single aspect of the production line, from the running speeds to the different thicknesses of the dough at various points throughout the production line. It also controls the speed of the cutters or the die cutters that we will see later that give us the distinct shapes and sizes that we produce off of this production line. Now at this point we see the shapes that the, the dough has been cut into, which is kind of interesting. What is this? Well, Doug, this is a distinctive shape that we developed for one of our customers. We call it the flat top lavash wrap. And what's, that, what, what's happening here is that, first of all, we're taking that continuous 
sheet of dough and we're stamping out this distinctive shape. Uh, it has a flat top to it, meaning that the rest of it is round, rounded, but the top of the circle is cut off only because the customer wanted to create a sandwich, which is a uh, bottom tuck and a folded wrap type sandwich, leaving the top open in a ice cream cone type of sandwich. Hence, we developed this shape very closely with that particular customer. And it worked well for him? It worked very well. In fact, our sales volume has actually doubled in the last, in the last several months. What happens to all the excess dough going up the conveyor belt? Is that thrown away? The excess dough is taken onto this conveyor and it's routed all the way back to the robotic mixing system that we had seen earlier. It's, uh, it's actually metered in using an electronic scale and it's reincorporated into our doughs. Now from this point we actually see the bread going into the oven. I mean, we can feel the heat. This is very hot. Yes, it is. It's, a, it's entering a conveyorized tunnel oven. Using metal plates, we bake the product directly on the heart of these plates. The oven is approximately 800 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. We're actually going from a raw piece of dough to a finished bread product in 30 seconds. Okay, here's the bread coming out of the oven. As you can see, it's done. We've uh, incorporated fine bubbles as a result of baking. The product is very, very hot, approximately 200 degrees in Fahrenheit. It's really hot here. Where is the bread going at this point? As it comes out of the oven, it drops onto a conveyor and it's actually being fed into a spiral climate controlled cooling conveyor. We entered this conveyor at 200 degrees Fahrenheit and when the product exits, approximately three minutes later, we have now brought the bread temperature down to uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It exits onto this white conveyorized uh, table where the product is stacked, put into plastic bags, and then run into a heat sealing machine. At this point, the bread really has come to the end of the assembly line, hasn't it? Yes, it has. We put it into its packaging. We've heat sealed the product and now we're running it through a metal detector checking for metal contamination and after we've done that we check the weight of each individual package why do you have a metal detector examining the bread what what could could be there since the bulk of the construction of our equipment is metallic we use a metal detector to check for the possibility of any uh, uh, metal contamination that may have occurred at any point in the process. I mean, we, something that may have fallen off a of machinery, a shavings or something? Exactly. It could be stainless steel in nature or, or ferrous uh, or even non-ferrous metallic. This machine is capable of, of checking for all those different types of metallic contamination. That's very interesting indeed. And how accurate you know, and consistent is the weight of each of these packages that goes out? Or isn't that important? Well, in this particular machine, uh, which is a very sensitive machine, we are checking the weight of every package according to the specifications of our customers. So that um, if the product is under the weight specified by our customer, the package of bread will actually be rejected. So the bread has now been packaged, sealed, and ready to go. How long will it stay here before it leaves the plant? Well, in a couple of hours, the product is loaded onto a tractor trailer and then it's shipped off to any one of uh, a number of different distribution points. Very interesting process indeed. And it doesn't take long to go from start to finish, does it? No, in a matter of uh, just over an hour, we can produce product from a, uh, from a scratch material to its finished to a fully baked uh, bread. And this goes on 24 hours around the clock every day of the week. Exactly. You make a lot of bread. We make an awful lot of bread. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Who are some of the customers that you sell these products to? In New York, everyone's our customer. The retail stores, the restaurants, the guy on the corner, you know, the little kid at school. But in the past years, we've evolved them more than a New York bakery. Chick-fil-A has been a a big customer of ours a few years back they wanted to come out with a wrap program they didn't want what everyone else had they sought us out um, they might have been afraid we were too small for them at the time but they supported us 
and we rolled out a wrap program with them and very possibly as good a wrap sandwich as you'll find in this country. Beyond that, um, we sell to the military, to the schools. We sell to Cisco, who nationally distributes it. We sell to Flowers Bakery. They just launched our breads into a lot of programs and a lot of restaurants, including a up-and-coming restaurant chain called McAllister's Deli. D'Angelo's a couple years ago said, hey, we have a wrap sandwich, but we want a sandwich that has low fat. Therefore, we need a bread that is very minimized in fat. We said, we'll give you bread that has no fat. So they became a customer. We just started a program with Einstein Bagels. They took a bread similar to this. They said, we like this panini bread. We're looking for a bread that we can season and toast. So we need something that could absorb the flavoring, but yet when toasted, kind of crunch up. Went back to the drawing board, reformulated. We made them a bread that they like. And hey, you know, you don't have to be an Einstein to figure out how to make this kind of bread, but really not any baker could do it. We did it because we put our heads together, we saw what they wanted, and we formulated a bread that worked for them. You really have a lot of customers, don't you? We got a lot of customers, but not enough. And you are looking for more, obviously. <laughs> There's always room for more. We're looking to move. We have some designs on new equipment. We learned a lot about this bread industry in the last 74 years, and particularly the last two. And um, we know that there's always room out there for a baker's baker, and that's what we are. The lowdown on the latest in the world of bread from the principles of one of the oldest family-owned bakeries in New York that is helping to set the standards in the bakery industry today. I'm Doug Llewellyn, reporting from Brooklyn. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Close Up on America's Business.